right. <laughs> Hi, everyone. If anyone is online, sorry about that. I just had to figure out how to get the actual stream going. For those that are watching this later, um, thanks for tuning in. Um, so this is the first time I am doing a live uh, talk, and um, it's quite an exciting step for me. I did kind of decided to do this on a whim, um, and I thought it would be... Um, it would be a good practice and an icebreaker for me because I will be a presenter next week at the World Veterinary Congress um, at the CTICC in Cape Town. Um, and seeing as this is my first uh, streaming live event, I'll just be talking and demonstrating some things. Um, I still need to learn and get a handle on the new software that I installed so that I can do proper screen sharing and showing you things uh, more visually. Okay, so I will um, later on share some PowerPoint slides with splendid pictures um, of radiographs, and um, I will do that in a separate video. Um, I also had a really good laugh earlier when one of my clients asked me what I was doing with that banana in my picture <laughs> that I used for the thumbnail for my YouTube clip um, when I'm actually just holding the two bones. Um, it was a proper lol moment. Um, all right, so my name is Antoinette, and I am a veterinary nurse um, from Cape Town, South Africa, and I qualified from the University of Pretoria in 2006 with a diploma in veterinary nursing, and at university, I quickly realized that um, I really love anatomy, and I love theater and surgery, and seeing what goes on inside the body. Um, so in my 18 years of working in the veterinary field, um, I have spent an inordinate amount of time um, and hours assisting in theater with surgery, helping with um, the repair of uh, torn cranial cruciate ligaments and correcting kneecap, uh, kneecap uh, patella luxations uh, and fractures, um, uh, just to name a few. Okay, so I really do have a deep insight of what goes on behind the scenes and what actually goes on inside your dog's body, um, what the affected um, and damaged uh, tissue structures look like, um, which ones are cut through when we do surgery, and what the insides look like, and then what the, reco what the recovery period is like as well. All right, so in 2010, I went over to the United States, to uh, Knoxville, and I attended the University of Tennessee to do a bridging course to become a certified canine rehabilitation practitioner. So I have been doing small animal physical rehabilitation for the past 14 years, and I have assisted in the healing process of thousands of animals. And uh, this year in June, I will be celebrating the second year of my um, business, Healing Hands Pet Physio. So I specialize in doing home visits for patients following surgery. Um, because following surgery, your dog needs to be managed super carefully to protect the stifle if it was, especially if it was a, a stifle surgery. Um, and so post-op management is a very challenging period for owners. I hear it over and over again. Um, and it is time consuming. It takes six to eight weeks uh, for for your recovery. And in this time, transportation is a risk. Um, and then sitting in waiting rooms can cause uh, stress and getting in, out, in and out of a car is challenging, especially if you've got a large breed dog. Um, so that's why I personally prefer doing home visits and then treating my patients um, in the comfort of their own homes. So the cases that I most see are post-op cranial cruciate ligament repairs. Um, and so today I'm gonna to take a deep dive into the canine stifle um, so yeah, we're going to have a closer look at what happens when there is damage to the cranial cruciate ligament and then what the consequences are. Um, and then I will, uh, I want to create some more follow-up content on this topic. So I would encourage you uh, to reach out with questions or if you've got any specific aspects, uh, things that you would like to be discussed in more detail. All right, because I'm here to help solve your problems that you are facing um, with your pet, pet during this recovery period, because I know how stressful it can be. All right, so let's look at the stifle. All right, so did you know that cranial cruciate ligament disease is the number one diagnosed problem in canine stifles? Um, and so why do dogs develop 
this specific problem. So unfortunately, because of a dog's natural design, they are prone to developing this. It is a chronic degenerative condition that, de that develops over time um, and with gradual weakening of the ligament. There's very few cases where it will just be acute and suddenly it, it does happen, but it's usually not the case. So it is partly because of the dog's design, but also because of excessive uh, pressures and repetitive strains um, on the ligament. So there's currently no genetic link to the condition, but some breeds have certain anatomical uh, conformational abnormalities, um, and that is mostly genetic. So sometimes you see dogs um, with very upright hind limbs like the Sharpe. Uh, their backs, their, their legs almost look stilted, like they're walking on high heels. And this can predispose uh, those certain breeds to cranial cruciate ligament disease. Um, so very often my clients will say they were playing with their dog, they were fetching the ball, or they just jumped for something, and then suddenly they went lame. So their cruciate ligaments have probably been taking repetitive strain with certain activities, um, and then eventually it develops the tear. So it is difficult to avoid, but there are certain things that you can do to potentially minimize uh, the risk. So the first thing that you can do for your dog is to keep them at a healthy weight. Um, overloading joints with excessive body weight is the worst thing that you can do for your pet. Um, and I can't, I almost can't um, like express that enough. Uh, it's very important. Um, the second thing is to is to not over exercise them before the age of eighteen months. So in young dogs. Like we like to throw the ball and playing frisbee and it's all like it's a fun activity, but it does pose a high risk of injury. And I know it's hard because young dogs have a lot of energy and we need a way to, to keep them um, happy and, and just get, all, get rid of all that energy. Um, so in young dogs, their growth plates are still open in their bones and then their cartilage, um, which is the connective the connective tissue that covers the ends of the bones, um, it's still immature and it's soft. And so when we over-exercise them, it puts excessive and like unnatural strain and impact on that soft cartilage. And in the long term, that is going to cause irrevers irreversible damage. Um, so repetitive impact on soft cartilage in the joints is going to remold the structure of that cartilage. And then that is going to develop into osteoarthritis as they mature. So up until 18 months, I would recommend you sticking to gentle play, uh, nice interactive toys. Uh, they love to chew things. You can focus on that. Um, you can do more focused activities like learning how, if teaching them how to do a nice square sit is worth gold long term. I would recommend all pet owners to teach your dog how to do a nice square sit. Um, and eventually you can work that into doing a squat um, to strengthen hind limbs, which is also going to which is also going to minimize the risk of developing um, this condition. And then controlled leash walks with occasional hill work going uphill is great for activating hind limb muscles. Um, and then you can also focus on more behavioral training and mental stimulation for your youngster. And so I'm not telling you to take the fun out of your dog's life. I just want you to nurture your dog safely um, to ensure a long, strong and healthy uh, life for them. So, and then you will have a well-behaved, confident and strong canine uh, companion. All right. Um, I think it's very valuable for pet owners to better understand what is actually happening inside their pet's bodies because gaining a deeper understanding is going to empower you to make better decisions to optimize your pet's longevity and it is also going to allow you some compassion and some comprehension of the complexities faced by veterinary professionals when they do suggest treatment options. All right, so what is the design of the stifle joint? Okay, so the, de the definition of a joint is a flexible connection between two or more skeletal elements, like two bones. So over here, <clears throat> I've got a femur bone, and this is the tibia, 
and where they meet, that is the joint. Okay, so my book, uh, Dogs in Motion, describes the stifle joint as the most complex joint, um, a leg joint. So both in terms of its movement and then also in terms of its construction. So a true joint like this possesses a cavity uh, in between um, two cartilage covered surfaces. So like I said earlier, the ends of these bones, like the end of the femur and the end of the tibia has cartilage covering it and in there you've got a joint cavity. Okay, so cartilage is another magical component of a joint that I'm going to look at in a moment because understanding the importance of cartilage um, is very valuable in knowing why we need to take such good care of joints. Okay, so experts classify the, the stifle as a chambered joint with three subjoints. All right, so the first one, like I said earlier, we've got the femur here and then the thigh bone and where they meet, um, this is the first joint. So the tibia here at the bottom is your shin bone. Okay, and the second joint is here where you have your, this is what we call the trochlear groove. It is at the bottom of the femur and this is where the patella rides. And I can show you <clears throat> on this little model, there's the canine knee from the side and when you flip away the patella ligament, there on the inside is the little patella. So there where the patella meets the femur, that is the second joint. And then here at the bottom with your shin bone, there's another small bone here that is that I don't have now, but it's the fibula, and that is the third connection. All right, so the femur is the heaviest and the largest bone. And the patella, like I said earlier, the kneecap, um, and it is the kneecap and it rides nicely <clears throat> in the trochlear groove. And then the tibia and the fibula are your two lower, um, your two lower legs in the body uh, and the hind limb that is your shin bone. All right. And as you can see, it's got a very sharp sort of front of the shin. This is the front of the shin bone. And we all know how sore a knock to the shin bone is because there's very... Uh, little tissue coverage there, like the bone is, is very close to the skin. All right, so the stifle joint um, is, it's, a, it's got a complex network of, um, of multiple ligaments and, tendon, uh, and tendons, which we're not all going to go into. Um, and then just quickly, what is the difference between a ligament and a tendon? So a ligament, like the cruciate ligament, will join up uh, bone to bone and it's right there in the very center so it's connecting <coughs> the, the two bones and then a tendon um, is attached at the end of a muscle which then attaches to the bone so attaching muscle to bone all right the cranial cruciate ligament all right so firstly what does the word cranial and what does the word cruciate actually mean all right so the word cranial derives from the Latin word meaning cranium, which means skull, okay? And um, the word, so, so when the word cranial is used by veterinary professionals, it is used to describe a, a particular part that is closer to the skull side of the body. So the word cruciate is also derived from Latin, and it means crux, which is a cross. So basically it means you've got two cross ligaments crossing one another deep inside the stifle joint and the cranial cruciate is sitting at the front. So you can see in there, uh, let me see that, in there sits so two, you can see that nicely now. That is where the two cranial, uh, the, the cranial and the caudal uh, cruciate ligaments are sitting. They are at the very center, the deepest inside of the joint. Okay, so why is this joint so important? All right, so the cranial cruciate ligament has three very important jobs. Okay, so if we're going back to the stifle, all right, so femur bone and the tibial bone. All right, so what this cruciate ligament on the inside does it is stopping this shin bone, the tibia, from displacing forward. So the femur 
is not sliding off this bone. So it's stopping that movement, all right? Other thing it does is it inhibits this tibial bone from rotating too much <clears throat> inwards, okay? So it's stopping that, it's stopping that, and the last one is excessive extension. It's going to stop that you can't overextend the knee joint. Okay, so those are actually three very important roles because if those things happen, um, it's bad news for the knee. Okay, and so there's an important bit of anatomy that I would like to highlight here. When we are looking at the top of the tibia bone, all right, we can see that it slopes. There's a bit of a slope to the back, okay, and where the femur connects here, if the cruciate ligament is not there, it's going to slide off the slope. Um, and that abnormal movement is where the pain and the damage is going to come from inside the joint. Okay, so in humans, this top part, which we call the plateau of the tibia, is flat. So it is for this reason that humans can walk around with an ACL tear, which is the equivalent of the, the cranial cruciate ligament, and we can walk around with it without too much consequences for quite a while. Um, I've known of people that will walk around with a, a off cruciate for months and then only go for surgery. Okay, and so ACL tears are very common. We hear about them in rugby and soccer and skateboarders, tennis players, squash, squash players, especially because they're doing like bursting movements. There's a sudden stop and a turn, and then that can just cause the strain on the, on the cruciate ligament. But in dogs, this is not the case. In dogs, this abnormal wear and tear inside the knee is immediately going to cause inflammation and damage to the cartilage. All right, so let's quickly look at cartilage. Um, cartilage is a smooth and, in my opinion, a very sexy connective tissue found in many areas of the body, but obviously in joints as well. Okay, so it covers the end of bones uh, where, the, where the bones meet. And it's quite soft and just porous, and it is made up of 70 to 80% water which is quite interesting. And the rest is mostly collagen. So, <clears throat> sorry. All right, so why is cartilage important? Okay, cartilage acts as a shock absorber and it offers cushioning between the bones. So as your dog is moving and it's taking impact, it's gonna offer cushioning and support. And the smooth nature of cartilage is gonna reduce friction and it's also going to enable a very nice gliding movement as your dog is moving around. So when cartilage is experiencing abnormal wear and tear with, uh, with cranial cruciate ligament disease, it's going to cause damage and it's going to cause inflammation. All right, so let's quickly look at what the five signs of inflammation is. We all know about inflammation, but what are the actual signs of it? So the first one is pain and there's swelling. It can be redness, there's heat, and then there's disuse. So I'm going to give you just some early signs to look out for when um, your dog may have cranial cruciate ligament disease. Okay, so the early signs can be very subtle um, and they can be easy to miss. So I often hear pet owners saying to me, Oh, um, they think that for a dog to express pain, they will have to vocalize it, or they, can't, they, they didn't understand that the dog was in pain because they never cried. But I'm afraid when a dog reaches the point where they're actually vocalizing their pain, you, you've kind of at a point where they need medical attention and strong drugs. Um, so what are the things that you can look out for? All right, so one of the first signs will be a subtle lameness. There's going to be a slight offloading and there's going to be there's just going to be that slight unwillingness to put full weight on that back leg um, there's going to be a compromise in the movement and they might be showing you that when they get up it's a little bit more difficult and if you look closely you will see instead of them pushing themselves up with their back legs they might be pulling themselves up with the front legs and then often another sign is when they sit the affected leg or the sore leg will be splayed out to the side. 
Um, another thing to look out for is an is a increased um, stiffness in their movement. And then often they will just start to be unwilling to do the things that they normally find to do. They don't want to jump on the couch or on the bed or in and out of the car. And then with playing, they might be less willing, uh, willing um, to interact um, with their usual playing activities and things that they enjoy. And they might just be a bit more reserved. Um, and then sometimes on walks, they will be a bit slower. They'll want to stop and rest and sit down. And they'll often just look at you like, like, they, they, like they need help. All right. And, and so with time, um, the, the more they don't use this leg, um, you're going to start noticing a disuse atrophy. So the muscles in that back leg is going to start getting smaller. Um, and then also, if you place your hands over that knee, um, you can um, often feel that there's a little bit of swelling, depending on, on how long it's been going on for. Um, it might be a bit thickened. Um, they often get what we call a medial buttress. So there's a thickening on the inside of that knee. Um, it can be warm to the touch. Um, and it's, it's good to feel both, so you've got a comparison. And so if you do notice any of these signs, please, please book an appointment with your veterinarian. This is not a condition that is going to magically resolve by itself. And it is unethical to leave this untreated and unaddressed. Um, so once your dog's knee starts suffering from inflammation and pain and compromised mobility, the development of arthritis is quick and the, the quality of life is going to decrease a lot. So diagnosis is the first step in taking action in the right direction. All right, so your veterinarian um, will have to evaluate the knee for what we call a positive cranial uh, draw sign. Um, and that is that action that I was talking about earlier, where you've got that displacement. That is a positive cranial draw sign. All right. Um, <coughs> sorry. Take a sip here. Yeah. All right. So often the vet will recommend doing x-rays. So just a note on radiographs, they are not actually going to visualize the actual uh, ligament inside the joint, but they are going to show you <clears throat> if there is joint effusion and uh, any arthritic changes to the joint. Um, and so with effusion, it's a fluid buildup, um, which is causing swelling and pain because of that ligament damage. Um, so this can sometimes be super challenging to check a dog that is already painful in the knee, um, and especially with large dogs with, um, with big stifles, it can be very hard to assess. So usually your veterinarian will recommend booking your dog in for um, a sedation to do proper x-rays and then a thorough examination of the knee to determine the degree of the cranial draw sign while they are sleeping. Um, so it's less stressful for everyone, especially for your dog. Um, so if the ligament does have a partial tear, the cranial draw sign will be subtle. Again, so this will be easier to assess if your pet is uh, sedated. Um, and then sometimes conservative treatment um, is an option for partial tears, but it is hard and it needs to be done with very special care um, and with a physiotherapist. Um, and then other times, when there's a complete rupture, uh, the cranial draw sign will be very obvious. There's a lot of movement. Um, and so regardless of the grade of the tear, it is going to be painful and your veterinarian will definitely be prescribing a course of anti-inflammatory uh, medication. So with complete ruptures, uh, you will almost always require um, be required to, to do surgery. So there are different surgical options which your veterinarian will discuss with you. Um, in smaller dogs, generally weighing less than 15 uh, kilograms, the surgeon can recommend a lateral suture technique with a nylon, which will then mimic the job of the ruptured cruciate ligament um, to stabilize the joint. And then in larger, heavier, more robust breeds, the surgeon 
um, there's a variety of options that they can do, and it will depend on what your surgeon surgeon is um, is trained for. So the different techniques um, are the TPLO, which is a tibial plateau level osteotomy, and then your CCWO, which is your cranial closing wedge osteotomy, and then you also get the TTA, which is a tibial a tuberosity advancement. So it all sounds very fancy words. Um, as the name describes, these techniques aim to level out the sloping plateau of the tibia that I was talking about earlier. So remember the tibia is sitting at a slope and what these surgeries will do, it is aiming to level it out, to make it flat so that the femur can no longer slide off it. So instead of that happening, it's now flat and stable. All right, so these surgeries are very advanced um, and they do require a specialist to perform them. Um, I've assisted with a lot of them and they, they are quite intense um, because we, we alter the biomechanics of the knee so the slope becomes level. And like I said, then the femur can no longer slide off the top of that tibial bone. Um, so these surgeries do require cutting into the bone with a saw and then altering the bone and drilling a plate in place um, to stabilize the cut structures. It is quite an intensive surgery. Um, however, the results and the healing can be very positive if it is done by a capable surgeon and it is managed correctly with post-operative care. So from my side, post-op physio starts the moment they leave theater. There's a common misconception that um, physiotherapy equals vigorous exercises, and movements and hydrotherapy. And yes, it definitely is part of physiotherapy, but that is not what happens directly after surgery, okay? For me, there are three treatments that are 100% worth doing within the first three days following cranial cruciate ligament surgery. Um, and this can also apply to patella corrective surgery, but today's topic is the cruciate. All right, so when I was still working at the, at the hospital as a theater nurse um, and assisting with a surgery, I made sure that all my surgical patients received these treatments post-op. So as soon as the patient leaves theater, someone applies an ice or a cold pack uh, wrapped in a clean or cloth or paper. And uh, this cryotherapy or cold therapy will massively help reduce the swelling and the pain. And it only needs to be done for five to 10 minutes and anyone can do it. Um, a week ago, I took a slip off the stairs I knocked my shin bone open and immediately my partner ran with a big bag of ice and we put it on my shin and the swelling was massively reduced and it really helped with the pain. So it's so easy to do. Um, I cannot stress enough how helpful this is. There's a lot of research that actually shows how efficient this is. All right, so the icing or the cryotherapy can repeat it up to three times a day um, for the first 72 hours during that acute inflammatory phase following surgery. All right, so the second thing that um, I think is very valuable to do, the second treatment, is scar tissue massage or mobilization. So when we leave scar tissue um, just to do its own thing, it can get hard, it can get sticky, and eventually it can restrict movement in an area and this can cause severe pain and it can really hinder proper movement. Um, I remember a couple of years ago, I saw a post-op cruciate patient. Um, the surgery was done maybe um, three months prior to me seeing the dog. The scar tissue was rock hard and the range of motion in that knee was so limited. I couldn't flex it fully and the extension was so poor that it actually caused a marked lameness in this dog. Um, and that was just another reminder for me <clears throat> of how important treating scar tissue um, is. So if you massage the scar tissue early on, it's going to remain soft and you're going to keep it mobile and you're going to help to heal um, it in a more orderly fashion so that your collagen can just align a bit better. 
So I would encourage doing this frequently throughout the day for only a couple of minutes at a time. Um, you literally just use your fingertips in a gentle circular motion with soft pressure and you don't need to need, you don't need to use any massage oil. So this treatment can continue after the 72 hour um, period time frame um, and it's gonna uh, it's gonna really encourage maintaining softening the tissue um, and to get better alignment of your collagen during your continued healing process. Okay, and number three for treatment to, uh, um, to apply from day one post-op is passive range of motion and uh, PROM for short. So what this basically means is you are just taking a joint passively with your hands through its range of motion of flexion and extension. You are passively flexing and extending the knee with your hands while always supporting above and below the joint. So immediately following surgery, it's always best to stay mid-range. So this means you're doing very gentle flexion and very gentle extension. We just want that little bit of movement. So you're not going to be pushing the knee into full flexion or pushing it or forcing in anything into full extension. Um, there's no forcing of things here. You are staying mid-range and we just want to encourage healthy movement. And so this passive movement is going to encourage blood flow and this in turn is going to help with reducing the swelling and the removal of all those um, inflammatory waste products um, after surgery. So after surgery, um, you are going to see that your patient will choose to rather keep the knee in a more flexed position. And that is this is in an attempt to protect it. And they don't want to put weight on it yet because it's sore. So because of this, the, the stifle is losing its full range of extension. And then the associated muscles can get tight and even contracted if it's not, if it's not treated. So by taking the stifle through flexion and extension, you keep the soft tissue structures mobile and you're going to reduce the risk of muscle shortening and contraction. So that is why it is so important to work on these operated limbs as soon as possible after surgery. The old school um, thinking pattern of um, popping the dog in a cage for eight weeks and leaving them, it's, it's so outdated. Um, these dogs need to be worked on as soon as possible. Uh, and just by doing these very easy, gentle treatments, you can really eliminate long-term uh, complications. All right, so I've just recently made another YouTube video teaching owners these three treatments. You can find them um, on the channel. So I would, I would really encourage pet owners to watch them. Um, I, have, I have sent them on to, um, to all my clients that have had uh, cruciate ligament um, surgeries done on their dogs. So the recovery period for um, for this for these cases are six to eight weeks. Okay, because it takes six to eight weeks for bones to heal, um, and so then the leg will need to be protected um, and managed with the utmost care. So there are some golden post-operative rules. Okay. And they are activities like no running off the lead. Your dog needs to be on the lead probably the most time. Um, you're only going to walk them uh, for toileting purposes on the lead. No jumping. No jumping in and out of the car, on and off the bed or the couch. They should not use stairs. And they should not be slipping around on tiles, wooden floors, laminated floors, so I recommend clients lay down carpets or yoga mats. You get rubber liners. Um, you can go to plastics warehouse. They have rolls of really thin rubber liners. They're fantastic to use and they're cheap. Um, you might need to cordon off certain areas in the house um, to minimize any risk of injury. Because if your dog falls and slips after a surgery like this, it's bad news. <laughs> um, so you will have to implement some level of confinement at home. Okay, and then depending on the size of your dog, it's advisable to use, um, you can use a, su a suitable sized crate. Um, I've had some clients rent crates 
um, that are that are massive. They set the crates up in the living room. The dog is still part of the family. Um, they're still hanging out, but um, they can't just run up, uh, jump up, and start running around when they hear uh, a bird or another dog barking. Okay, and then you also get really cute little play pens. Um, I've recently treated a Boston Terrier, and the, the owners bought the cutest little play pen off a uh, take a lot. Um, and again, it is placed in the living room, and the dog is still part of the family life, uh, and they don't feel isolated. Um, but if none of that is an option, um, you can designate a special room where your dog can just chill and, and stay. Okay, so post-op, we do recommend frequent, slow, short, controlled leash, leash walks on a non-slip surface frequently throughout the day. So gentle loading and weight bearing of the leg um, enhances good bone healing. You do want to load that bone. We want walking. Um, and it also helps with a callus formation, which is part of the bone healing. All right, so we do want the dog to use the leg, but it must be in a safe and controlled manner. Um, this is really good for getting that muscle activation going, um, regaining limb and joint awareness, balance, and also improving your dog's confidence. Because during these surgeries, like, the surgeon cuts through a lot of tissue structures. There's a lot of things that happen in there. And um, these legs are often very dumb after these surgeries. Like, the dogs aren't sure what the leg is doing. It's weak. And... Um, so it's important to very gradually get them back to just comfortably using the leg and rebuilding that confidence. Um, so, yeah, the recovery period and post-op healing and returning to normal function, um, I reckon, is an, a whole entire topic for another day. And it is something that I want to do and I'm going to do it. Um, but I would like to tackle that in more depth. So for today's topic... We were just talking about what actually happens inside the stifle. Um, and I think I've given you a nice anatomical lesson. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to leave it at that for today. I uh, just want to see chats here. <laughs> Lundy is laughing at me. Yes, I had a good laugh at your banana comment. Uh, low cut. Oh, thanks for knowing all the fancy terms. Well, it's what I've got to do. Um, Lundy, working dogs have to go over jumps and retire and retrieve a dumbbell. At what age is it really safe for large breeds to do these jumps? Um, so Lundy, I um, I would do. I, I don't. I think small jumps um, with a with a large breed dog before they are eighteen months um, would be okay. Um, I wouldn't do it every day for long periods of time, but I would recommend um, if you, I would wait until 18 months until you know your growth plates and your, your cartilage is fully matured before I would really um, going full on. Um, that is a very good question, but I would be um, I would rather be on the safer side and use a little bit more caution um, when they are still young. Um, and just do, yeah, just do small, small bits, baby steps. Um, yeah, but I understand working dogs are full on and they, um, yeah, they want to get going. All right. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, I really enjoyed this talk. Um, I think it was good for me to, to give it a go. I don't know if there's anyone else that wants to comment or um, Nicoline, Rian Furi, Nicoline, hello. <laughs> um, is it Nicoline van Onderste Poort? I'm a little bit confused here. Yeah. I think it might be. Anyway, I hope you learned something. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions, pop them in the comments below. Um, you can send me an email. All my details are on the channel. Um, and then please have a look at the video that I posted on the um, on the three treatments to do post op. Um, and yeah, let's let's keep on educating. Um, these are very thing, very valuable things for for pet owners to know. Um, 
Oh, dit is Nicolien voor die. <laughs> Och, lekker man. Oh, ek kan nie wachten. Ek kan nie wachten om jou te zien volgende week nie, by, uh, by die congres. Ek gaan jou groot vet druk gee. Och, lekker man. <laughs> cool. Alright, thank you everyone. Um, oh, dankie Lena. Dit is so lekker om, om te sien julle is hier so. Ek waardeer het. Oh, thanks, Dash. I just plan to see. I'm glad to see people are online and actually watching and supporting. Um, it's good for for building the online confidence um, because I do I do love sharing uh, information with clients and um, doing it one by one um, is is not always it's not always easy. It's better to have a good platform where you can share to to a lot to lots of people. All right. Um, cool. Thanks, everyone. I'm going to sign off. And uh, yeah, like I said, if you've got any more questions or suggestions or anything, please uh, leave them in the comments and, um, and I will answer you to the best of my ability. All right. Lots of love. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Bye.